Welcome to our Tutia Tavola cooking class, sponsored by the Loft Cooking School at Mongo. So many people are connected with us today, and we at the Italian Chamber of Commerce of Ontario cannot thank you enough for the enthusiasm you've shown us since we have started. I hope you're enjoying this beautiful summer day. This is perfect weather for a nice barbecue in the patio. Our chef, Roberto Fracchioni, is ready to start. This evening, we will find out what a tri-tip steak is, how to grill it to perfection and serve it with a smooth side of polenta and burrata. What a wonderful mix from top quality Canadian cuts to Italian traditions from the north to the south of the booth. Today's recipe is inspired by Longo's Summer Experience magazine, now available for free at Longo's until they last. Pick up a copy next time you're at Mongols. It contains many recipes perfect for grilling. You can also enjoy the magazine online at www.longos.com. Also online, from early August, you can check the schedule of Longos cooking classes, which will be back in the fall season and will offer programs for adults as well as for children of all ages. Longos and the Law share with us a passion for healthy eating through the use of excellent local products from the farm to the table, combined with the traditional Italian products and ingredients defining the recipes that every Tuesday we bring to you through the expertise of Chef Roberto. With a 20 year long experience as executive chef in top Canadian restaurants, as a can brand ambassador for the Prosciutto di Parma, as a professor of culinary arts and food consultant, you can rest assured that Chef Roberto will transfer to you many of his secrets that result in wonderful dishes, easy to prepare, that will surprise your family and friends. And remember to pair an excellent wine with our recipes. You can find great wines when you shop at selected Longos locations. Before we proceed with our video, Italy, the art of living, to show you some images of the places, history, and traditions that lay behind some of the products we have showcased so far during these classes, I would like to remind you that next Tuesday, June 23rd, we will feature spear tuna with chickpea salad and gremolata, using the best ingredients, all sourced at Longos. Also, on Wednesday, June 24th, we will do a special presentation for local food media, influencers and bloggers that you can follow via Facebook Live. We will talk about pizza al padellino, Italian style pan pizza, and a selection of certified cheeses and cured meats in collaboration with the Italy Toronto store on Blue Street. We hope you will enjoy this evening's class. We look forward to your photos on the tri tip steak that you will bring to the table later on. So enjoy the video, and right after, let's get tutti a tavola. Buon appetito! What is it that makes a country extraordinary? Its monuments? Its art? Its cities reflecting its history? Italy is bursting with beauty. Beauty you can admire, beauty you can immerse yourself in. But nothing tells the Italian story more than its tastes and aromas. An essence you can only discover when you live it fully. An essence that awakens memory and all the senses, becoming almost tangible in a glass of Prosecco surrounded by the hills. In a pizza, fresh out of the oven at the foot of Vesuvius, taste and aroma transport us to the places where they were created. To the names and origins we proudly protect, they evoke the intimate connection between humankind, enchanted lands, and majestic cities. They are the guardian of our history, the heritage of traditions dating back centuries, living on in the age-old skills repeated by new generations, telling us who we are today while whispering to us about the future, encapsulated in our products and carrying our greatest art, the art of living. And there is no greater value worth protecting 
No better product worth exporting. Hey everybody, um, welcome to my patio. Uh, today we're going to do a little grilling. Uh, it's a wonderful time of year. Everybody's out on the barbecue. Uh, it's something to celebrate. So I'm going to run you through a very, very simple dish. Um, with simple dishes, they're always, you know, the hardest to do. So <laughs> the simple dish that we're doing today is a tri-tip steak. So tri-tip steak, just to give you a little background, it's often called a bottom sirloin. It's also often called a triangle steak. It's also called a California steak. It has many, many, many different names. Uh, but it is the tip of the sirloin from the, the bottom side of, uh, of a cow. Uh, and it's a wonderful piece of meat to cook. It's um, not as tender as a beef tenderloin, but it has way more flavor. Honestly, the flavor in a tri-tip is much deeper, much richer than a tenderloin, than a strip loin. So I like to use it a lot. Uh, the thing with the tri-tip is that it takes a little bit of a little tiny bit of work. Uh, first thing, we can't overcook it. If we overcook this steak, it gets very, very, very tough. So if you enjoy eating your meat medium well or well done, seriously, don't try the tri-tip. Uh, it'll be too tough. This has to be served rare or medium rare. So medium rare is 135 degrees. Um, I'm going to walk you through how to know when you've gotten to 135 degrees. Um, but Anything other than that, yeah, anything higher than that, just, just stick with the tenderloin, even a strip loin. Um, it's a wonderful steak, tons and tons and tons of flavor, but you have to treat it properly. Uh, the second thing is that we have to cut it um, across the grain. So you can see here, when you look at the piece of meat, you can see that there's little lines in the meat, as I'm hoping you, can, you guys can see that. Uh, that is the grain of the meat, and it's very important to know which way that runs on the piece of the meat, because we always want to cut across the grain. And by that, I mean when we carve this after it's cooked, we want to cut this way, 90 degrees to the actual grain of the meat. If we cut it with the meat, it gets very, very, very tough. Um, it's just like a piece of celery. Think about a piece of celery. It has all those strings on the backside. So we want to make sure that if you, if you eat a whole piece of celery, you get the little strings stuck in your teeth, which is not cool. Uh, so you want to cut across, basically cutting all those strings into, into small pieces so you don't get that stringiness in your mouth. So we have two different types here. So this is the whole tri-tip. So this is a nice large piece. You can also um, uh, get pieces that are already cut. They're cut, again, across the grain the right way, but you can see the beautiful marbling on this piece of meat. And that's what you want. Don't be freaked out by all the fat. Fat is flavor. Fat is nice and tender. That's what we want to see. I'm going to do both of them so that you can see the different preparation method. Basically, they're both getting marinated, and the meat isn't essential. You don't have to do it because this, this cut of meat is is tender enough that it doesn't really need the marination. I just like doing the marinade because it really allows you to get a ton of flavor into your piece of meat. So our marinade is very, 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 very simple. We start with a whole bunch of herbs. So the herbs we're using today, a little bit of parsley, a little bit of oregano, a little bit of rosemary, and a little bit of fresh thyme. So here are all our herbs. And to prep them is super easy. Our parsley, all we're going to do is just chop it up in a little bit. The reason we're cutting it up is so that the little pieces will stick to the piece of meat so that when we go to, to uh, the little bits of parsley will stick onto the meat and it just looks, looks a little bit nicer. Uh, we also have a little bit of rosemary, fresh rosemary. And again, this one, I always say this whenever I do a class, Try not to chop your rosemary. When you cook with rosemary, it's best to sort of treat it like a bay leaf. The reason is if you your rosemary and your knife isn't very sharp, what happens is that the rosemary gets crushed and the flavor changes quite drastically. It becomes very soapy. 
And a lot of people don't like rosemary because they're used to that chopped soapy kind of flavor. So if you just pick it whole into little sprigs like this, we put it into the marinade, the flavor will be extracted. And you'll get all the benefits of the rosemary without having any of the, the nasty business of the soapy crushed rosemary flavor. We also have a little bit of fresh oregano and the oregano, we don't have to do anything to it. I'm just breaking it up into small pieces. And then we have our fresh thyme. And the thyme, we, again, we don't have to do it. I'm not going to sit, I'm not, I don't have to pick it. You can pick it if you want into little, little leaves. But during the marinating, usually the leaves will get loosened from the stalk and they'll fall into the marinade, which will stick to the meat and will get our desired effect. But you don't have to bother with it. You can just stick it all in, nice big bunch of herbs. So once we have our herbs, that was all of, what, a minute and a half? We take our herbs into a bowl, and I like to do my marinade separate. We're going to marinate in the, in the Tupperware container, but I like to make my marinade separate. Um, it just gives you a little bit more control and makes sure that you're going to get a, a more even uh, coating on the meat. So the two ingredients we're going to is a little bit of balsamic vinegar. So on the recipe, I had red wine vinegar, and I often use red wine vinegar for this. But uh, the wonderful people at uh, Longo sent me a whole bunch of balsamic, and the balsamic has a little bit sweeter flavor. Uh, and so I'm going to use the balsamic instead. This is the beauty of cooking. Even though all these recipes, feel free to modify them. Uh, with this marinade, if you don't like rosemary, you really don't like rosemary, first of all, try it without chopping it, and you'll see it changes very much. But if you still don't like it, don't put the rosemary in. It's really simple. Uh, this is our other ingredient, a little bit of olive oil. So this, uh, it kind of hurts some people to put so much olive oil into a marinade, and then at the end, you just sort of pour it out down the drain. It's kind of sad, but it is necessary to, to really get the flavor in get a few pieces of garlic, a couple pieces of garlic. I'm just going to chop them up into small pieces and be very liberal with the garlic. Use lots. Don't be shy. Use as much as you think you need. And then when you're done, throw a couple more in there. Uh, you can't, it's really hard to overdo. So out of all the flavors that we're putting into the bowl, garlic is the one that will sort of release its flavor the least. The herbs, you'll get lots of flavor from the herbs, but the garlic, it, it takes quite a bit in order to get a good amount of garlic flavor. So once this is all mixed up, you just give it a little stir to make sure that your oil and vinegar are somewhat mixed together, and then we marinate our meat. So ideally, you want to let this go overnight. Uh, you can marinate. Today, I'm not going to let it go overnight. I'm not going to ask you guys to come back tomorrow. Um, but it's best to do it overnight so that the meat really has a lot of to absorb all those flavors. So I'm just going to toss this all around in the marinade, make sure it's nice and covered. And yes, we use our hands a lot. It's part of being a chef. You get dirty hands all the time, but we wash them a lot, so don't worry. We put our lid on, and what you want to do is put this into a fridge. Now, I always use Tupperwares when I marinate or some sort of, you know, sealing container so that you can flip it upside down. Every now and again, you go into your fridge, you flip it upside down, you flip it back, you give it a little shake. Make sure that you're getting that marinade all over all the surfaces. And once that's done, like I said, we put it in our fridge and we four hours or eight hours or six hours, whatever it is, and we start cooking our steak. So while that's happening, uh, we're going to start doing a couple other things. So the first thing we're going to do is actually wait, I should ask if there's any questions. Any Hi, questions? chef. Uh, yes, we have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, in regards to the herbs, did you wash them before you used them? Yeah, so that's all washed and dried ahead of time, um, just to make sure there's no sand, especially parsley has a tendency to have lots of sand and grit in it. So yes, they're all washed before. 
And would you usually add any salt or pepper in the marinade? <clears throat> so you never salt the marinade. It's a very important, a very important uh, aspect. Um, the purpose of a marinade is to penetrate into the meat. The acid breaks down the connective tissue, which makes and all the herbs and garlic and balsamic vinegar and oil penetrate in to flavor the piece of meat. If you put salt on it, salt does the exact opposite. It draws all the moisture out of the meat. So it will dry out your meat, it'll make it tougher, and it'll prevent the penetration of all the flavors into your piece of meat. So never salt and marinate. You can put pepper in if you want, absolutely. There's no problem with that. Uh, I'm going to put it on when I actually do the grilling. Uh, somebody's also asking if instead of the Tupperware container, they can use a Ziploc bag. Yes. Yeah, Ziplocs work really well too. Uh, if you have the big giant Ziploc bags, you absolutely can. Uh, I just usually use, you know, the, the hard plastic containers because I can stack them in my fridge and I never have enough space in my fridge. Uh, so I usually use the hard ones. It's just what I'm used to. And uh, just one question uh, in regards to the garlic. Last week, uh, you told us all about how to remove the root of the garlic. Did you do it this time as well? <laughs> yes, yes, and I'm going to show you guys that again. I, if you could see in here, they've, uh, they've all been removed already. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through that when we use the garlic for the salsa verde. So don't worry. Thank you for catching that, though. That means you guys are paying attention. Um, and somebody's asking, is tri-tip the same as flank steak? No, they're, they are similar in the fat content and the flavor, uh, but they're from different cuts. The, the tri-tip is from down here, the sirloin area, and the flank steaks are from down in the shoulder. Okay, so we're going to move on to polenta. So polenta is... Um, I don't know. For me, as a northerner, uh, I, I have a very soft spot for polenta. Love, love cooking polenta. As a kid, I never got to eat it. I never got to eat polenta uh, because my dad, having lived through the war, that's all he ate for about five years. So he hated polenta. So my mother never cooked it for us. So it wasn't until I was a, a young adult that I discovered polenta. Uh, and since then, I, I love it. I put it on my menus all the time. I eat it at home all the time. It's a full little side dish. But today, because it has a tendency to be a little bit boring for some people, I'm going to show you a couple quick ways to, to make it, I don't know, way more flavorful. So we're going to start with a little bit of chicken stock. Now, I'm using chicken stock. You don't have to use chicken stock. You can use beef stock. Stock. You can use, uh, well, you can use water if you want to. Uh, you can use mushrooms if you get some dried porcini mushrooms and you soak them in water. You can use that. There's, there's no wrong liquid to put into it. Whatever liquid you put in, that's the flavor that you're going to get at the end. So a little bit of chicken stock, and we're just going to put it onto a medium high to get it to come to a boil. So. When it comes to a boil, we turn it down to a low simmer and we add our actual polenta. And polenta is strange because polenta is a dish. The term polenta refers to cooked cornmeal. But here in Canada, we usually call the actual, the actual flour, the actual ground up corn. It doesn't really matter. It does refer to the entire dish, but it is just ground up corn. Uh, the important thing is you want to find one that has sort of a larger grain to it. Some of it is super fine, and if you use the super fine polenta, the super fine uh, ground cornmeal, it just it ends up more like porridge than it does like true polenta. So our stock is on the stove or on the burner. You can at this point start flavor to it. You can start adding herbs to it. You can start adding mushrooms to it. You can throw peppers. You can put chili flakes in there. Whatever you want the final flavor to be, you want to start now. Um, the one thing if you're buying store-bought stocks is always remember not to salt it until you get near the end. Some stocks, some of the, the chicken broths and chicken stocks that you buy, some tend to be a little bit salty. Um, I've tried this product many, many, many times, uh, and it's not so salty. 
but I still wait until the end to add our salt. So if you do use store-bought stocks, again, hold off on the, hold off on the salting. As we're waiting for our stock to come to a boil, we're going to start, actually, before we start talking, I'm going to ask if there's any questions. Uh, yes, just a couple of questions for the polenta. Uh, if you can just repeat briefly uh, what you uh, laid down in the recipe, how many cups of polenta did you use and how much stock to how much uh, polenta are you using? So the basic ratio for a polenta that's a little bit loose, a little bit runny, which is the way I enjoy it, is four parts liquid to one part uh, cornmeal. So if you're making, I mean, today I'm doing a full liter of stock and I'm going to use 250 milliliters of cornmeal. 250 milliliters of cornmeal, that's enough for easily five, six people. So generally, I do about, I don't know, I do about between 70 and 80 milliliters of the, the ground cornmeal per person. Okay, so... We're going to move on to making our salsa verde. So this is, again, a very, uh, very dish. Uh, the salsa verde is something that I make all the time um, with my aunt. When I would go visit my aunt uh, back home in Italy, it was one thing that she always used to make, and she always did it so well, and it, for her it was just like something she did when she was bored and she didn't have she had some time on her hands. But it's a dish that I have come to really love and I've always had it on recipes, on menus that I've written in the restaurants. Uh, it's always somewhere. A million different salsa verde recipes. Not only across the world, but even in Italy, uh, from region to region, town to town, everybody makes their salsa verde a little bit different. So this is my Zia Elsa's recipe. Zia Elsa was like, honestly, she is the most naturally talented cook I've ever met in my life. Not a professional, but when she cooked, didn't matter what she made. She could boil water and it would taste fantastic. So this is a little recipe that I've never really shared with anyone. Um, and it's not, I don't know, revolutionary crazy about it. It's just, I don't know. I just remember standing there at the table, chopping herbs, chopping herbs. She didn't use a blender. Uh, and it's one of the most I don't know, wonderful times of my life. I did the same with my mom back here. Uh, for hours and hours chopping herbs, but I'm going to show you guys the quick and easy way to do it. So salsa verde is very simple. Basically, we start with a whole bunch of herbs. So you can use whatever herbs you want. So I use primarily parsley and flat leaf Italian parsley. Uh, I've tried it with the curly parsley, and it's, the flavor is just not the same. The flavor of flat leaf parsley is much bigger. It's much stronger. And you want that in the salsa verde. So a little bit of parsley, and you just pick it, wash it, uh, and then pick it. And don't worry if there's some stem left on it. If there's some little stems, don't worry about it. We're going to chop it all up anyway. We're going to take a little bit of chives. And with the chives, we have to do a little work. Now, the parsley, we don't have to worry about the, the, the stems going into the blender. But with the chives, we have to worry because chives are very interesting. inside. There's, there's some pretty strong strings in there. So if we just throw these into the blender, what happens when it comes out is you get these long, fibrous little bits of, of chives. And that's not really cool. So the chives, we're just going to cut it up first. Now, you don't have to cut them super tiny because the blender is going to do most of the work. But you just want to chop them up. You know, as fine as you can without or worrying about it. But if you slip and you make a longer piece, not a big deal. We just want to, again, try and get rid of that stringiness of all of the chive fibers on the inside. And then our rosemary, we're just going to pick it. I'm just going to put a little bit in, into little bunches. Very clean, very simple. And is the the base of our salsa verde. Now we start building our other ingredients into it. And we're going to talk about garlic now. So garlic, please, 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 please treat your garlic well. Uh, when you get a head of garlic, don't put it on your cutting board and smash it with your knife. Don't use a garlic press. 
if, if you do me one favor, don't use a garlic press. Garlic presses ruin everything that is good about garlic. When you think about garlic, remember it's it's like it's like a it's like a tomato. It's like a zucchini. Treat it with the respect it deserves. You wouldn't take a piece of zucchini and smash it onto your cutting board. So I don't know why we do it with garlic. If you a garlic press or you smash it and you smell it and you taste it, the flavor is completely different than what happens when you treat it properly, which is just this. It's very simple to do. You have the tip of this of the garlic and you have the root of the garlic. Trim off the root of the garlic. So just take off a top of it. And then what we're going to do, do this on a cutting board. I'm just holding this up so that you guys can see well. And we cut down through the center of the garlic, but we don't go all the way through. See how I'm stopping? Right there. I'm stopping before I get all the way through the garlic. Once that's done, you open it up, and the skin pops right off in two pieces, usually. And it takes, takes seconds to do it properly. The reason that I always cut my garlic in half is that. So you can see inside, we have those green little shoots. Garlic is a seed. It's trying to grow. It wants to grow. So the older it is, the more pronounced this little piece of green is on the inside. The problem with the green bits is that it tastes very not like garlic. It's good. Um, and it also is really hard for some people to digest. So you just pull it out, get rid of it, and you have a whole bunch of nice clean garlic. Uh, it only takes, it, honestly, I'm doing it slow, but it only takes a couple seconds and you will absolutely notice a big difference in the flavor of your garlic. If you, if you, I've had, I've told this to thousands of people and I've gotten hundreds of responses where people say, thank you very much. It does make a big difference. The other thing we're going to add is a little bit of roasted peppers. So. Roasted peppers, you can use the spicy ones if you want. Um, I generally, you know, my son doesn't like spicy. Uh, I usually go with, with these ones, just regular roasted peppers. You can roast them by yourself if you want. It's not that hard. Or you can just let the people at Longo's take care of it for you. And we just take out a little bit of roasted peppers. The recipe that I, uh, that I uh, and that everybody has is pretty pretty bulletproof. I've done it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, I'm just gonna eyeball it all. Our other ingredient that we're going to use is a little bit of anchovy. So it sounds kind of weird, but it works. You need a little bit of richness, so a little piece of anchovy. Not a like anchovy. You like anchovies? Throw some more in there. You're not gonna ruin the dish. And our last thing is an egg. So a hard-boiled egg, just cut it in half. Make sure that when you hard-boil an egg, when you separate the yolk and the white, it shouldn't be green or brown or back there. If you do that, it just makes the, the salsa verde a little, bit, a little bit muddy in flavor. So make sure you don't overcook your eggs. Once they're overcooked, they'll start to develop that, that grayness. And like I said, one, it doesn't look very nice. Two, it doesn't taste very great. So those are our ingredients. A little bit of olive oil, a little bit of balsamic. So to actually make this, it's quite simple. You throw it all in the blender. So when you're loading up your blender, you put the hard things generally on the bottom. The first, they're the first ones to go into the blender so that they're closer to the blade. They'll get chopped up a little bit finer. I'm using a little magic bullet because, I don't know, it's not as loud as my big blender, so I you guys. So what I'm going to do is put all the soft stuff in the top, and then because the blade sits on this side. So there's a whole bunch of herbs here that I already picked and chopped. So I'm going to throw all this in. Like I said, all the soft stuff furthest away from the blade. And then we keep on our other ingredients. So our rosemary goes in. Our uh, roasted peppers are pretty soft, so they're going to go in next. Our eggs go in. 
our anchovy goes in and a little bit of garlic. I'm gonna keep those back. We screw on our top and there's no liquid in here. There's no, there's no vinegar, it's just the ingredients. The reason is we want to chop it. We want to sort of chop it all up. We're trying to, to you know, recreate chopping by hand. So if you put liquid into it, it is automatically going to get pretty, pretty runny and pretty slimy. So I'm just going to puree this up. It might be a little bit loud, so I'm going to stop talking for a second. Give it a shake so it all falls down. Nice thing. That's the other nice thing about the magic bullet is you can pick it up and shake it like a, like a cocktail shaker to make sure that everything gets moved around. Now, what we have to do is usually once or twice, we just have to open it up and push it down. Now, you have to make a call here. It all depends how fine you want your salsa verde. The longer you puree it, the smoother, the finer it will be. Um, if you want it kind of chunky, you just do it really quick. I'm gonna take it a little bit further. And that's it. Super quick, super easy. Now we take our liquid ingredients now and we... So before the liquid goes in, I'm gonna put a little bit of black pepper. I'm gonna put a bit in because I like you know, I like the, the pop of the black pepper. We add, again, a little bit of olive oil and goes in. And you can put this back on the blender and puree it, or you can just mix it with a spoon. I like to do it just like this, just with a spoon so that I can see the oil gets absorbed. Now, when you start adding the oil, the herbs are going to start absorbing some of the oil. So you can see it's kind of dry again. So you add a little bit more. And you keep going until you basically, until the, the herbs stop absorbing the oil. So you can see when I first put it in, the oil is just kind of hanging out here. But after it, it'll absorb into the parsley and especially into the egg. Now, a lot of salsa verdes don't have eggs in them. Um, it's just something that my, my aunt did, and when I asked her why, she said, I don't know, I like eggs. So I, uh, I didn't ask her, but I've done it without, and it makes a big difference. It adds a lot of richness to the salt. And again, this is just like the marinade for the steak. If you like, I don't know, if you like mint, throw some mint in here. It'll brighten it up. It'll make it taste a little bit, you know, a little bit more summery. You can add whatever herbs you want to this and whatever ratios. Again, if you really don't like rosemary, don't put so much rosemary in. So now you can see it's just starting to, uh, to resist absorbing the oil. So we just add a little drop of balsamic vinegar. So the vinegar is, is essential. You need some form of acid because it helps preserve the salsa verde. So this will last, I mean, usually I'll make this, I'll throw it in my fridge in a little glass jar, whatever I don't use, and it's good for a couple weeks before it goes bad. So once all that is in, the acid helps do all the preserving, and the other little bit of preserving comes from salt. So we put a bit of salt in, stir it around, so that there's done. Easy, right? Any... Uh, any questions Sorry. before I move on? Uh, yes, we have a few questions. Uh, you already answered one about the eggs, but uh, a few people have asked, how long would you cook the egg to make it a perfect hard-boiled hard egg? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the million-dollar question. So with eggs, um, yeah, there's, there's 50 different ways to hard-boil an egg. The way I do my hard-boiled eggs, always start them in cold water. If you put them into hard water, they'll crack. Hard, hot water, they'll crack. So put your eggs in the cold water, put it on the stove. Once it starts to boil, you set a timer for five minutes. Boil them. It doesn't have to be a crazy big boil, um, but just, just simmer boil them for five minutes. Take them out, put them into uh, some cold water, 
and you're done. That's it. Uh, let them sit in the cold water for about five more minutes, and then you peel them under running water, and they'll turn out perfect every time. And can you substitute the uh, fresh anchovies with anchovy paste? You can, you can absolutely. Anchovy paste uh, is a wonderful product. It incorporates, you know, into dishes very nicely. So absolutely, you can you can do it. It's just a tiny, tiny bit anyway. So yeah, a little dollop of anchovy paste will work really well. And can you just please quickly repeat the kinds of herbs that you used? And also earlier, you were talking about not chopping the rosemary, but is it okay to be used in a blender? So, so um, in, in a blender, when you use rosemary, the on on a blender are moving really quite quick and they're usually fairly sharp so they do a better job of chopping up the rosemary uh so yeah i always when i do the rosemary in in a blender i don't get that soapy nastiness so yeah the the herbs were parsley um uh, oregano uh, chives sorry parsley chives and rosemary as the base but that is again just the base if you like oregano throw some Put mint. If you like lovage, throw lovage in there. Uh, you could just pick whatever you have kicking around and start making a salsa verde. Uh, just one more question. Can you freeze the salsa verde? Uh, I've never tried it. Um, <clears throat> generally, when people make it and they realize how good it is, you'll find that you'll use it on everything. Uh, I use it instead of pesto. I'll use it to make like a super quick pasta a spread on sandwiches so yeah no in the in the fridge like i said it lasts for a couple of weeks um i've never tried to freeze it uh you would think it'd be okay in the freezer but you guys let me know whoever makes it try and freeze it and then let me know uh and just one more question about the eggs uh, how long can you store a boiled egg in the fridge uh well that's a good question i don't know i mean i've done it for three four days no problem. The problem with eggs, uh, even hard-boiled eggs, the shells are porous. So if they're in your fridge, they're basically a sponge and they absorb all the flavors that are hanging out in your fridge. You don't really, you know, your fridge never stinks like anything, but there's a lot going on in there. Uh, there are a lot of scents in there that we don't, we don't notice because you open the door and the air goes out and you don't really smell it. But if you keep it for too long, yeah, they will start that are happening uh, in your fridge. So you don't want to keep it for too long. Three, four days, that's all you need. It takes, it takes you know, 10 minutes start to finish to boil an egg. So you really shouldn't be, shouldn't be worrying about it too much. So there's the grill. Now, they, like, I'm doing this, uh, not even medium heat. It's not a crazy high heat, um, but you don't want it too, too hot. When you cook proteins, when you cook meat, when you cook, poultry, whenever you cook proteins, you want to do it at a low temperature. Very, it's much more, uh, much more gentle on your meat, and the meat will turn out much more tender. So, like I said, ideally we would be marinating this overnight, but I don't think you guys want to come back tomorrow just to see how this ends. So I'm going to put it on, and I'm just putting the big one on. Now, the small guys are going to cook very quickly, so I'm going to do those a little bit later. The important part here is that we don't move our steak too much. We don't move it too much. If you move it around, every time you move it, you're forcing juices out of the meat. You're agitating it. You're making it angry. So don't. Just leave it alone, especially if you go to flip it and it's sticking. If you get in and you like can't pry it off of the grill, uh, it means it's not ready to flip. So just relax. Give it some time, have a sip of wine, and everything will be wonderful. The other thing that we're going to do is I'm going to grill some corn. So I just have some corn. It's been husked, and I'm just going to fly, put it right on the grill. So this is going to be for the polenta. So, again, because I said the polenta, you know, it tends to be a little bit boring, uh, I'm going to show you guys this little trick of just putting some whole kernels of corn into the polenta. It adds a vegetable element, but it also adds some texture to the dish, and it adds, you know, a little flavor. So our stock is simmering, and we're going to start putting our polenta in. Are there any questions before I start doing polenta? 
Uh, yes, yep. Chef. Somebody was asking, uh, you said earlier about the mushrooms that you can uh, uh, rehydrate uh, and use them as a stock for the polenta. Can you just explain a little bit more what you meant by that? So if you, uh, if you get porcini mushrooms, so porcini mushrooms are wonderful mushrooms, very, very flavorful. If you take your porcinis and put them into some warm water, you basically make porcini tea. And what the porcini, what the dried mushrooms do is they release all of their, all of their liquid into, and their flavor, uh, sorry, their flavor, not their liquid, they release the flavor into the liquid. So you end up with a mushroom flavored stock. That stock can be used to make the polenta. The same thing with the mushroom uh, risotto. If you're making a mushroom risotto, you make a mushroom first. So a little bit of dried porcinis and some warm water, and you let them sit for, I don't know, 15 minutes, and the water will turn brown, and you'll get a beautiful, rich base to start cooking your, uh, your polenta or your risotto in. So, so now, oh, another question? Uh, yes, uh, yeah. somebody was just asking if you can please repeat uh, what kind of rub you used on the meat. Um, so the, 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 on the meat, oh yeah, I forgot to put the good stuff on. Sorry, thank you for reminding me. So this is uh, the rub that I'm using for the meat. So this is a little bit of barbecue rub. Um, this is just to give it a little bit more flavor. The marinade is oil and balsamic and some fresh herbs, but now we're just going to give it a little more flavor by adding Oh boy, that's a use the shaker side. Don't try and free pour it like I did. <laughs> so that half is going to be very flavorful. And yeah, this is just uh, the Longo's uh, barbecue rub. And it's a great product. It has tons of flavor in there. And again, it's just a way to boost it, make this even more rich. Because this has a lot of flavor, this cut of meat, we can get away with using lots of flavors. We can get away with using garlic and herb and a nice barbecue. Uh, rub. Um, if it's a tenderloin, you overpower the flavor of the meat very quickly. So I have to get started or I'm going to run out of time. So we just start slowly adding our ground corn to the stock. And I'm whisking so that we break up any little, you know, balls of the cornmeal. If, if you don't whisk, you can, you can stir it in. I mean, usually Quite often, I'll just stir it in with uh, with just a rubber spatula or a wooden spoon. But sometimes, I mean, often I'll just to make sure that you don't get any lumps. And all we do is give it a little stir until it's all incorporated. You can switch to using a rubber spatula or a wooden spoon. So I'm just going to put it back over there on the heat, and I'll show you when it starts to come together. How we, uh, how we start mixing it with a, a spoon instead. So, our meat is cooking. Our salsa verde is done. This looks good. And I'm just going to take it out of this container because it looks kind of kind of not so nice. And again, this is the quick and easy way. If you really want to do it authentic, grab a knife, start chopping. It takes quite a bit of time. Uh, but it's a rewarding bit of time. So, salsa verde is done. Our steak is cooking. We are ready to go with the little guys. Actually, you know what? I'm going to wait a minute for the little guys. One thing I wanted to point out, when you're grilling, you always want to make sure that you're using different tongs. So, I'm using these tongs to start cooking our meat because Halfway through, once the meat is seared on both sides, you want to switch to a different pair of tongs. These get contaminated with raw meat. And if you cook with this through the whole process, when you're taking the meat off when you're done, you're basically incorporating raw meat onto your, your cooked piece of meat. So not a cool way to, uh, to cook. So a raw pair there, and then I use a different pair. Make sure they're very different, either they're long and short or plastic, or these are completely different shapes, so that you don't get mixed up. One for raw product, one for cooked product. So I'm just giving my corn a little turn, and our polenta is simmering 
nicely. So I'm just going to bring this phone over so you guys can see what it looks like when it's simmering. So that's Brenta simmering away. And this is a bit high of a simmer, so I just turned it down a bit. You just want a nice, light, gentle simmer. Now, when you're doing the polenta, always make sure you get a really large pot. You want the pot to be way larger than, than you need because it's like lava. Like right now, as it's, you know, spurting and spurting around, um, it, it's, it's boiling hot. So if you're doing this inside, all those little splatters will go all over your stove and it'll take you 45 minutes, take you longer to clean your stove of all this stuff than it does to actually make the polenta. So make sure you have a nice big pot to try and catch some of those little, those little spatters. So this is about how you want it to be cooking. Nice little bubbles coming up, nice and gentle, nice and easy. And that's it. We let it simmer like that for a little while. It does take quite a bit of time. The coarser the ground of polenta, um, the more time it takes to actually cook. So it, does, it is something that you need to be patient with. Any questions? What? Uh, thank you, Chef. Um, can you mix coarse cornmeal and soft cornmeal to make polenta? Uh, um, no, it's not really good. If you, if you mix them, then the, the, fine, the, the fine polenta will cook very quickly and the big grains will still be raw. So if you cook it until the fine stuff is cooked, you got big pieces of raw corn. If you cook it all the way until the big pieces are cooked, the fine stuff just turns in bad mashed potato consistency in there. So it's always best just to use one or the other. Uh, and what's the general guideline as to how long you cook the polenta? Polenta usually, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't vary much based on the volume. Like if you're doing 250 mils or you're doing, you know, six kilos of polenta, it all takes about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, depending on how high your simmer is. The fine stuff is done quicker and there is instant polenta. So there is a, a polenta a, a ground cornmeal uh, that cooks in like two, three minutes. Um, it's not as great. Uh, I don't like the flavor as much, but it's super convenient. And yes, I have used it. Um, I'm not that big a snob when sometimes I'm in a super big rush. I always have some uh, in the pantry just in case I need to pull off a polenta in five minutes. Uh, we just had another question in regards to the rub. Can you show us the rub again and tell us a little bit about what's inside the rub that you used? Uh, 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 uh. So... That is the, the Longo's Barbecue Rub. So, a uh, great product. Let's see, do they actually give us? Yeah. Sea salt, spices, uh, sugar, garlic, onion, canola oil. It's the spices that make it good. So, with most rubs, they don't tell you exactly what spice goes into it because, you know, the kind of proprietary secrets. Uh, all I know is that it tastes really, really great. Um, there's a good amount of paprika in here, which I really like in my rub. Uh, the garlic is a nice amount of garlic again. Um, so, yeah, you don't have to know exactly what it is. You just have to know where to get it. You can see it's coming off with just a little bit of, of work. And all we want to do is up and rotate. I didn't flip it over. You can't hear me at all. So once the meat is rotated, we just let it cook longer. Okay, so we don't have to have to worry too much. We don't have to keep poking it. You actually don't want to agitate it too much. We just want to make sure that it's cooking nice and evenly. And we stir up polenta again. So my polenta is getting a little bit dry here. You can see it's just getting a bit too dry. So if this happens, and it does happen often because, you know, depending on the amount of milling, sometimes you need more liquid, sometimes you need less. Uh, I think this was simmering for a while before I realized it was simmering. <laughs> what you can do is just add more liquid to it. 
So uh, I used all the chicken stock. So instead of that, I'm just going to use a little bit of water. Um, I have enough flavor in the, in the chicken stock already that this is just to, to get the consistency right. So I'm just going to add a little touch of water. And if I have to, I'll add some more a little bit later on. So back to a nice runny consistent, consistency. As it cooks, it'll just keep getting drier and drier. So I'll put a little splash more in there. And again, I think that was just because I let my stock simmer and it evaporated a little bit too much. So there you go. Even professionals make mistakes every now and again. So our corn is grilling, our meat's done. Any other questions while I buy some time while everything cooks? Uh, yes, chef, thank you. Um, how many minutes before turning the meat over or how long do you keep the steak per side? So there's, there's way too many variables for me to tell you exactly how long. It depends on how thick your piece of meat is, depends how hot your barbecue is, depends how hot the grills were to start. Generally, it's about five to seven minutes, and then you rotate it for another five to seven minutes, and then you flip it over for about four minutes to four minutes. The second side, whenever you cook a piece of meat, the second side always cooks quicker than the first side. And the reason is simple. There's a lot more heat already in that piece of meat. So I'm going to show you when we get there, when, it, when it's ready, I'm going to show you when to turn it, how to let the meat tell you when to turn it. Even though there's a lot of variables, like I said, in grilling a piece of meat or doing it in a pan, one thing is always the same. doesn't matter whether the cut of meat it is, how thick or how thin it is, is that blood boils at the same temperature. So once the heat penetrates about halfway through the meat, it gets to about 100 degrees, 105 in the middle, um, you'll start to get little bits of blood sort of percolating, coming out of the meat on the top surface. That's when you flip it over. And then you wait for the same thing to happen on the top side. By then, your core is to about 125 degrees. Now, a piece of beef cooked medium rare is 135 degrees. But we have something we call carryover cooking. So carryover cooking refers to the fact that when you stop cooking a piece of meat, it continues to cook. It doesn't matter if it's something that you put in the oven and you're roasting or you're grilling something or you're searing something in a pan. It doesn't even matter if it's a vegetable or a starch piece of protein. The cooking keeps on happening after you turn off your heat on your grill, after you take it out of a piece of, uh, out of a pan. So what we want to do is take this off when it's 125 degrees because during the resting period, it will cook another 10 degrees. So I'm going to show you when we get there, which is very soon. Actually, we're there already. I'm going to swing this over and you guys can see. You can see that here in the middle, you'll start to get right there. You're starting to get little bits of blood and juice sort of coming up through the meat. Um, that's the signal that it's ready to flip. So now what we're going to do is take our meat and now we do the flipping. You can see charring on that side, nice and dark. And we let it cook. Again, it should be about four minutes, a little quick flip and another four minutes, and we should be good to go. So one last thing. Oh, sorry, there's a question. Yes, can you just please give us uh, some options as far as meat? Can you use ribeye steak, for example? Absolutely. I mean, this is, uh, I'm using the tri-tip because I think it's a very uh, underappreciated and underutilized uh, cut of meat. So yeah, you could, I mean, the marination, you can do it with a strip loin, with a ribeye, with a porterhouse, with any of the like, you know, bigger, stronger flavored cuts of meat. Like I said, beef tenderloin, it would overpower a beef tenderloin because a beef tenderloin is very sweet and very tender and uh, doesn't have as much flavor. Uh, I find anyway, some people argue with me about that, but 
so yeah, any any of the the cuts of meat that are you know a little bit a little bit tougher would benefit from this this method of cooking. Any other questions? No. Awesome. Okay. So one last thing that we have to prep uh, for our polite take the kernels off of the corn. So this is the fun part. This is the part where we get to make a big mess. And uh, there's really, I don't know, there's some people who have little secrets on how to do this. I'm just gonna show you the way that I do it. So our corn, hot off the grill, place it on your cutting board like this. And we just run our knife down so that all the kernels fall off. Just a couple times you do it, the kernels are going to hit the cutting board and they're going to go all over the place. Some people will do it inside a bowl. We'll get a stainless steel bowl and shave off the kernels into a stainless steel bowl. I don't like doing that because my knife always hits the stainless steel and it dulls my knife. So I don't like having dull knives. I prefer to just do it on a cutting board and a whole bunch flies around. Once you have a little bit, you can make a little moat. Make a little wall of corn so that when you do the next one, the corn kernels are going to be stopped by the moat of corn. So we just shave this down. If you have time, and I like to do this a lot, save your, the cores of the corn. Now, there's still a ton of flavor. We're just taking off the big kernels, but inside here, there's still a lot of there's still a lot of corn in there. So if you take these and you put them into a pot of water and you just give it a quick simmer, I'd say 15, 20 minutes, corn flavor will be extracted. And then you can use that as your liquid to make the polenta. That will give you even more flavor, a lot more flavor actually. Uh, and it's just a good way to use up all of the products that we have. We don't want to waste anything. And in restaurants, we don't waste anything. So our tri-tip is ready to rotate. Again, I'm gonna take my polenta out. So the only way to really know if the polenta is cooked is to taste it. Uh, there's, if you look at it, you can't say, yeah, that looks done. So I'm just gonna give it a little taste. And it's good. Oh yeah, that's really Holy moly. So now that the polenta is cooked, we take our corn and we throw our corn into the polenta and we just give it a quick stir. Now, if your corn, if you want, you can do the corn ahead of time um, and then throw it in when it's cold. It doesn't really matter. The heat of the polenta will cook the corn through. And we just stir all this in. But you can add, you know, herbs, like I said, you can throw some chopped parsley or oregano or rosemary or anything that you want into here but because i'm using the salsa verde on top i don't want to i just want to keep this a nice clean corn kind of flavor so that's our polenta i'm just going to set it off to the side now and keep it warm during that time polenta will keep on cooking so as the polenta because the polenta is going to keep on cooking it's going to get a little bit drier so i'm just going to add a little splash of water so that as it sits here, as I'm waiting for the meat to rest, it won't dry out and get too, too, too solid. Okay, any questions? Uh, can you just give us some background on the polenta? It's a very northern uh, dish. Absolutely. So polenta is, you know, uh, a dish that is very prominent from northern Italy. And it's also a very, it's also a peasant food. It was always seen as a peasant food. And as I said earlier, you know, my dad during the Second World War, my mom, uh, they ate polenta every day, like every day. Uh, and that's why my dad would, uh, after he came to Canada. Uh, but nowadays it has become sort of, sort of cool again to eat, you know, peasant foods, to eat those classic, classic dishes. So we're going to bring it back. And like I said, I love doing it. I eat it all the time. I put it on my menus all the time. 
wonderful, wonderful, wonderful ingredient. So I'm cooking off the little guys now because they'll cook very, very quick. And I'm going to cook the guy off. So the other thing that we can do to make sure that our meat is cooked is just get one of these little uh, meat probes. They work very well. They, uh, they're very accurate. They're not crazy expensive. You don't have to worry about being wrong with your meat temperatures. Um, I always do this just to kind of check, and we're good. So now I'm just going to turn my heat off underneath my uh, underneath. Now this is an important part of cooking. Whenever you cook proteins, you need to rest your protein, and by resting I mean take them off the heat, and let them hang out. Don't touch them. Don't touch them. Uh, the more you touch them, the uh, the 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 tougher they'll be, the drier they'll be. This is so that the carryover cooking can happen. So that the heat that's trapped on the outside can penetrate into the core and all the juices in the core radiate out into the meat so you get a nice even, even cut, even cook of meat. So our little guys are getting flipped. And I'm running out of time. Really running out of time. Thank you guys for sticking in there. So we're going to get ready to plate because everything is coming together nice. So uh, take our big giant platter. And this is something that I always do family style. You can plate this, make pretty little plates of all these ingredients. But this is something, especially now, we're coming out of the whole, you know, coronavirus lockdown thing. We're starting to invite people over for dinner, the people in your circle. So this is a great dish that perfect to cook, doesn't take that long. It's taking me a while because I'm talking too much. Um, but really quick and easy and serve them. It looks pretty, pretty great. So we take our polenta, nice and hot. The great thing about polenta is that it stays hot for a very long time. So when you put this on the plate, it will stay warm, oh geez, for a good 15 minutes. So that goes on the plate first. And now to add a little bit of, bit of richness to the polenta, we're gonna add a little piece of burrata. So a beautiful little ball of burrata cheese. So for those of you that don't know burrata, get to know burrata. Um, it'll change your life, I promise you. The outside is a little shell of basically mozzarella, but when you break this open, actually I can do this on the other camera, when you see it, when you pick it up, it's very soft and mushy on the outside because inside is basically a very soft cheese. You can see it's like a ricotta, but has way more flavor. So we're just gonna pour a little bit of this on top of our polenta. So this way you can see it, it looks pretty, and then as people take it, they can, you know, take it off the plate. They can take it a little, as little or as much as they want and stir it into their, into their polenta. So the other thing we're going to do is top it with a little bit of our salsa verde. So our salsa verde, actually I should put that under the camera so you guys can see. So now our salsa verde goes on top for prettiness and for flavor. And then we're going to carve our meat. Now, ideally our meat should rest a little bit longer, but like I said, I'm running out of time. I'm just gonna take it off and I'm gonna start carving. So our meat comes off the grill. And remember, we're carving across the grain. We're trying to get all those little fibers cut up into short pieces. So our grain is very noticeable once it's cooked. You can see the line that's hot on my hand. And we carve our meat. Nice and thin. Like I said, it's it has a little bit of uh, a little bit of chew to it. It has a little bit of texture, which is wonderful. So if you cut it too thick, it just gets to be a little bit too chewy. So I'm going to carve the whole thing. I'm going to platter it up. 
like I said, ideally I would let this rest a little bit longer, but whatever. I hope you'll forgive me. Any questions? We're just about ready to finish. So, last chance for questions. Uh, yes, uh, we have some questions on the burrata. Did you use the whole thing? Can you use the outer part as well? Yes, yes you absolutely use the outer part. Now, for this application, just using the, uh, the inside, but the outside is basically like a super delicious uh, mozzarella. So you would absolutely use it. It melts very well. I could put the outside on top of it too, but generally I will remove it and sort of chop it up into smaller pieces so that it melts just as well. So I'm gonna put a little bit more salsa verde on here because yeah, it's that good. And this is it. This is the whole. This is the whole dish. Like I said, it took me quite a, a bit of time today because I was talking a little bit too much. Uh, but you can do this start to finish in an hour, no problem at all. You just have to marinate your meat ahead of time, and everything else can be done in an hour. Yeah, yeah that's right. Okay, okay, so yeah, yeah ten minutes, ten minutes late. late. Sorry. Everybody. I hope you had a good time. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, if you didn't get all your questions in, just go to Instagram at Roberto Fraccioni, private message, or direct message me any questions that you have, and I'll be happy to answer them. Um, next week is an awesome tuna that we're doing, so I hope that everyone tunes in again next week. Thank you to Longos for all the wonderful products, and thank you to Eco. See everybody next week.